Hi, I'm Carmen Cracknell and this is Forbidden Talk, where we debate social and cultural taboos in the Middle East and beyond. On today's show, we'll be discussing the controversial issue of jihad al nikah or as it's known in English, sexual jihad. But first, let's learn a little more about what this is and why it's so controversial. Sex jihad hit the headlines last year with news that women were travelling to Syria to temporarily marry foreign fighters, by force and many by choice. The women reportedly comforted more than one man, with some even receiving payment for it. Women came from various countries, many relatively liberal such as Tunisia and even from here in the UK. Added controversy came from the fact that many of the girls were reportedly underage and forced into the role by older male relatives. Saudi cleric Mohammed al-Arifi kicked off a wave of controversy after he allegedly issued a fatwa via his Twitter, saying Muslim women from the age of 14 are permitted to marry a jihadist for a few hours, then marry other jihadists in order to strengthen the fighter's morale and open the doors to paradise. During World War II, thousands of women in countries occupied by the Japanese Empire were forced into prostitution as comfort women and many Muslims believe that this concept of jihad al-nikah is simply the same thing, a cover for prostitution. Well, now here to discuss this controversial topic are Syrian activist and filmmaker Dr. Hala Diab and religious scholar Imam Mohammed al-Radawi from the Islamic Centre of England based in Maida Vale. We also have on the phone Dr. Anne Speckhard, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Georgetown University Medical School in Washington, D.C., and later in the show, we'll also be joined by two Tunisian guests, one of whom is a sheikh from Kairouan who supports sexual jihad and would prefer to remain anonymous for security reasons. Thank you, first of all, to my guests for joining me and to Dr. Speckhard on the phone. Uh, so my first question uh, will be to Hala. And I want to ask you, as a Syrian woman who knows maybe what's going on right now in Syria and the situation, how prevalent is the issue of sexual jihad? Actually? I think this is a phenomenon which was resulted from the sectarian conflict war that is happening in Syria. Uh, because, you know, Syria as, as a nation and Syrian people were Islam in a moderate way. And we didn't have encountered such a phenomena. And women have a such... Um, uh, priority and empowerment in Syria before the war. But this is a result of actually the jihad tourism that is uh, empowered by the regional powers and regional countries uh, that actually uh, made many uh, young fighters, whether from Europe or Britain or even from neighboring countries, to go and fight in the name of Islam. Mm. And, uh, and, and this is actually becoming an increasing um, a worry, not only for, for, for Syria, but also for the neighboring country, even for the international community, because many women are going to Syria to offer themselves as comfort women to their fighters. And actually, um, there was an article featured in the um, Fair Observer by uh, Egyptian campaigner Imam Baybas, who said that the Muslim Brotherhood and several Arab newspapers had claimed that the fatwas condoning such acts were issued by well-known religious leaders, including Yusuf al Qaradawi of the Azhar Mosque, and she also wrote that sit-ins at Rabah, Adawaya and Nahda Square in Egypt had welcomed and promoted this practice. Um, how, to you, Imam al radawi this question, how could these people justify jihad al nikah religiously? Uh, how could they justify? I mean, it's, if you look at the teachings of uh, Holy Quran, uh, we don't find uh, any reference to this. Uh, I don't know how uh, they have invented this. It's obvious they are uh, looking for uh, achieving their goals rather than uh, following the Islamic Sharia. Mm. Because according to Islamic Sharia, or uh, one of the main principle of not only Islamic Sharia, all divine religions, was to stop uh, corruption in the society. I think this is to have to do with the gender politics and its mm. relation with the Syrian war and the role mm. of women has been used and abused by these uh, fighters because they want to alienate the, the empowerment of women, whether it is in the Syrian society or even in the Muslim society. We have seen, for example, what happened in Egypt and in Tunisia, where women at the beginning were part of the, of the revolution and mm. the Arab Spring, and gradually they have been alienated and they were not taking part 
in the political scene. While here, from the very beginning, actually uh, the alphabet of this gender uh, barriers have been set by this jihad al nikah, where women are seen as only a, an object, sexual object, mm. to satisfy, to comfort the fighter, the, the, the jihadist, yeah. but they have no uh, uh, they have no role in, in the political scene, in the change, mm. and I think that is meant in order to alienate women. I think it would be uh, good at this point to go over to Professor Speckhardt on the phone. Thanks for joining us, um, Professor Speckhardt. I agree with our imam that uh, this is something that wouldn't be um, condoned by most teachers of Islam. And uh, I'm not sure it's even happening. I mean, there's rumors, but mm. they were put out. The news reports were uh, originated in Iran. Uh, this is looking to me like uh, propaganda from the Assad regime. And when human rights organizations went out and looked for the actual women, they couldn't find them. Mm. So many people in the West believe these reports, but uh, the evidence isn't there. So if we're talking about uh, serial, uh, quote, marriage, uh, basically prostitution, I don't think it's happening. You mentioned in some of your research on cultural and organizational aspects of terrorism, you, you talked in a similar vein to what Hala was saying, that this was a way of, um, you know, bringing women into the political spectrum or um, excluding them. Which, which do you think it is, if it is occurring or if things similar to this are occurring? Well, I can tell you from my uh, 400 interviews of terrorists that I report in my book, Talking to Terrorists, that women very rarely play a leadership role in terrorist organizations. And uh, they're sometimes sent as suicide bombers, but oftentimes not until the men can't cross the barriers anymore. Then they start to use women because they can hide uh, bombs in their clothing and they're not searched as thoroughly. Women also work as couriers. Uh, but they mm. very rarely have leadership roles, so that's nothing new. And uh, if we have, you know, very conservative uh, culture that doesn't have women in leadership to begin with, we can hardly expect them when they uh, uh, also have militant organizations to suddenly change. I'm just going to ask uh, Hala what she thinks of, of I, that I don't view. actually agree with the, the, the first part of yeah. uh, your guest when she said that this is not happening because this is, is happening and it started with part of uh, the camps, the refugees camps where many families, uh, many Syrian mm. women were forced yeah. to underage marriage and uh, to many wealthy Arab men and then it develops to, to take part where many women, uh, especially from Tunisia, there are around 6,000 Tunisian women who were prevented from going to Syria in order to offer themselves to the jihadists. And also in Raqqa, which is the northeastern province in Syria, there is a female army which is uh, trained by Daesh, which is the Islamic State of Sham and Iraq. Mm -hmm. And they recruit these women in order actually to uh, suppress other women in, in this Islamic state which is under uh, the control of uh, this terrorist uh, extreme group and they actually these women offer themselves to the jihadists. There is a big taboo here we are touching when we say that Muslim women are going to Syria to offer themselves to mm. the jihadists because you know uh, the revolution and the rebels and the opposition they don't want that to be discredited because yeah. they don't want to see that like Sunni Islam is attacked by you know um, uh, other um, people by other sects uh, Muslim sects and also because this is more political use mm. of Islam Islam has nothing to do with that thanks for that but point I'm Hala, just what, what I would like clarified uh, certainly there's women going to join the fighters there's no question of that but are they joining as marriage partners or are they joining as girls that are taken advantage of uh, in very short marriages that are basically uh, uh, a type of prostitution. And if you're saying it's the latter, I would love to hear your evidence. And I'm not saying that you don't know. You might have a much better uh, feel for what's going on on the ground, but I haven't found the evidence. 
I did some interviews when I was in the Middle East last year to do um, to write my one of my soap dramas, Aziza uh, of Baba Amr, um, and there were a lot of women who were abused uh, because of underage uh, underage marriage or because they were abused even by some organization which um, um, taking advantage of um, of some Syrian women. But inside Syria, we have seen many cases. Even um, um, the minister the, of uh, Tunisian, he said that there yeah. are Tunisian women who come back to Tunisia mm. and they were pregnant because of uh, of their uh, sexual um, relations or jihad and nikah which is happening in Tunisia. I, right. I think that was but, actually... But now he's been discredited, that's been discredited by many Arab sources that uh, he had political reasons for saying that. What do you think were his political and, reasons? Uh, that's not something I'm an expert in but I've asked my sources and they've told me he had his own internal reasons for saying that and that it's not credible. There was a Libyan uh, British fighter who went to Syria and he's fighting in Syria and there were two or three cases of a British Muslim woman who, who uh, traveled there and offered themselves uh, to the jihadists in order to uh, to get pa paradise and they are now settled as a family in yeah. in uh, Syria. Men and women are going to Syria to join the fight, no question about it. But, but are girls being recruited and going to become uh, what our imam would but wh agree what is the that what is actually i mean the defining line is what's happening in a war zone like syria where there are no moral uh, uh, disciplines there are uh, no, nothing uh, there are no rules of, of what is going on the ground in Syria because what is happening the moment these women are crossing the border to go to Syria whether they want to offer themselves or to marry mm. one fighter or they just it's want to fight once they cross yes they, the they're just stuck in a war zone where there is no protection for this woman I'd like to ask our third guest uh, Imam Aradawi what, what he thinks uh, there is no doubt that abuse is taking place. We have reports that uh, uh, aborted children are being dumped here and there mm. in the uh, demolished uh, houses and buildings where this abuse is taking place. It's not only taking place in the format of a, uh, a jihad and nikah, it, it's also taking place in the format of uh, sodomizing even young boys mm. and raping uh, this. So this shows that th these people who are fighting there, uh, their aim is if, if they were uh, true Muslims, they wouldn't be doing this. Mm. Because this is against Islamic teachings, mm. against any divine uh, religion, against any moral value as well to abuse anyone in that format. I think we'll, we'll end this section there. Um, I, obviously it remains um, a matter of opinion whether this is actually going on or not and, and, and dependent on you know what, what pe different people have read. Thank you very much Dr. Speckhard for joining us today. You're welcome and uh, I hope it's not going on but if it is it's a terrible thing it's very sad. Well, to find out the views of people in the UK, we went onto the streets to ask people if they knew anything about Jihad on the Kah. Considering how big this was in the media, few people knew about it. Let's take a look at what their reaction was when they were told. Why did they do it? Probably for, uh, I don't know, for honour and things like that, and, for, and maybe for patriotic reasons. I assume because they support the... Um, who's, which, which side are they offering it to? The rebels. The rebels. I, I assume right. because they support them. Are they being coerced? This is just your opinion that we're asking for. Oh, I don't know anything about it. I, this is the first I've heard about it. To offer support, I guess. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure, but I'd, I'd, I'd say maybe they feel like they need to offer support and show that there's people looking, to, like, looking out for them in a way, I guess. Probably pressure from, I guess, the people that are enlisting them. Well, why would you do anything like that like it's I mean mainly it could be out of desperation like it just depends on their personal circumstances and what would have what would make anyone do something like that and you know it can be hard to find a job in these times so if they're getting paid for it then that might be an only choice for them I can't think of any reason why they do it other than being forced to or getting money because they're in awful situations and like in poverty and the only way that they can survive is to sell their bodies. I don't know. I have no idea what must be going through their heads. I think they, they've been forced to do it over there.
seen from a lot of the Vox Pop interviews that most people in the UK just had no idea about this issue, despite the fact that it was big in the media about six months ago. What do you think about the fact that no one really knows? I think it's the uh, center of radical radicalization mm. center in um, in College um, uh, King College London. Say that there were three uh, British women, Muslim women, who were. Mm in Syria fighting and they were not fighting actually they offered themselves to uh, jihadists and they knew them through the internet. I think there is a little of um, coverage in mainstream British media about this topic. Why do you think that um, Because of the sensitivity of this topic mm. and because also of um, uh, the, the sometimes British media or even the British government or British uh, even uh, organization they are uh, reluctant to, to touch on very uh, sensitive Muslim issues. It's said in the uh, v at the beginning that um, Sheikh Al Arifi, an uh, influential Saudi cleric, had said that girls were permitted to marry a jihadist for a few hours, then marry other jihadists in order to strengthen the fighters' morale and open the doors to paradise. Um, Imam Radawi, what do you think about that when someone comes, uh, you know, a, a respected Sheikh comes out and says something like that well, publicly? Muslims should challenge that Sheikh and ask him, well, what is the reference, what is the evidence that he, he's basing this fatwa on. And if the sheikh is saying she can marry this one, first of all, he's uh, breaking the rule mm. of uh, seeking the permission of the father. Then, uh, secondly, she should uh, marry one person, not uh, immediately another person. I, I, think, s uh, just, I think some people um, are saying that this is being justified by some clerics due to muta, which is allowed mm. in the Shia sect. I mean, what would your response be yeah. to that? Muta is something that existed according to uh, Khalifa Umar, Umar ibn Khattab. He has admitted that it existed during Prophet Muhammad's time. And again, mm. again if you look at the rulings there, it has, it, the same rules apply there. You cannot do muta with a young girl who has never married, and uh, she should have the consent of her father. And then muta marriage is done, and muta marriage also needs waiting period. Mm. Waiting period is two months periods, and she cannot be available immediately to another person. It is wrong and against Islamic Sharia in any, according to any school of thought in Islam. I think there is a big responsibility um, um, on on uh, the shoulder of the Muslim mm. scholars, because. When you speak about Islam or religion, unfortunately, people don't take that into account unless you are a Muslim mm. scholars, you know, or imams. And yet, uh, the moderate or who call themselves moderate and liberal imams, they shy away from condemning such uh, uh, horrifying fatwas which legalize jihad or legalize. When Al Arifi came to London, there were reports that he was physically attacked by Muslims. I mean, in Al Arifi, uh, I actually tried to uh, interview him through um, Channel 4 when he was in London and he actually, he just left without... Uh, yeah, uh, I think there was some kind of altercation and, and he actually took down his statement shortly after putting it up yeah, because he, it was he so controversial. Yeah, denies, he denies what he yeah. says. But on this issue, I mean, how can clerics challenge these kind of, you, you might call him a rogue cleric maybe for, you know, coming out with these, these very controversial statements. How can religious figures like yourself challenge him? Yeah, well, in Islam, we are taught not to accept anything that we are is told uh, is said to us. We have to investigate. We have to. There is a verse. There are verses of Holy Quran. There are traditions that mm. if a person comes with uh, some information or news or ruling, you have to investigate. You you have to also look under what circumstances did this ruling come through, or whether if the ruling was. Uh, uh, change later on or not. These are the rules. Uh, first of all, we also believe that whatever Prophet Muhammad has made halal and permissible will remain halal until the day of judgment. Mm. So nobody is allowed to introduce new, new, ki new kind of uh, uh, practice. But we have to differentiate actually between the doctrine is Islam as, as a religion, as a faith, and, yeah. and also between political Islam or the use of some Islamic yeah. uh, uh, discourse uh, to suit the political agenda and some of uh, Muslim scholars these days are not actually standing for Islam they are actually mm. uh, standing for the political agenda of their political uh, uh, 
power or the countries yeah. that sponsor them. And that's what we need to investigate. What, what is the ag agenda behind this kind of uh, fatwas? What do you think the, the political agenda of Arifi could have been? I mean, I, I haven't had the chance to actually ask him to make sure that, you know, he mm. did, because he denied, he appeared on many Lebanese channel and he denied what he said. Mm. But yet, Al Arifi himself was part of the Muslim scholars who went to Egypt in July 2000, June 2013, before Mercy stepped, uh, before Mercy um, left uh, uh, the, the regime, and they actually called for jihad to mm. Syria from Egypt. Mm. So I think that he was one of the leading scholars who legalizes jihad, and yet he, you know, he or other scholars, they they do not base that on the fact they will send the daughters or their sons yeah. or even themselves to go and fight instead of really sending young people to fight. Mm. It's a very big responsibility because you're basically taking the life and death of sure. people. Sure, well we've hands. actually got on the phone now uh, Sheikh Hamis who is um, in Tunisia and actually supports uh, Jihad al nikah My question for you is, in your opinion, is there any basis in Islam for jihad on the Kah, either in the Quran, the Sunnah, or the Hadith. في بداية الحديث أريد أن يعني أن أتعرف المسألة إنه أول شيء إنه جهاد النكاح هناك يعني تشويه من الإعلام لمسألة جهاد النكاح والعبادة تكون على يعني بطرق مختلفة ومنها جهاد في سبيل الله والجهاد في سبيل الله يعني كما تعرفون يعني خرج في آيات عديدة يعني والذين آمنوا وهاجروا وجاهدوا وجاهدوا في سبيل الله والذين آووا ونصروا أولئك هم المؤمنون حقا لهم مغفرة ورزق كريم هي من سورة الأنفاس يعني كما تلاحظون يعني هناك عديد الصور التي تدعو للجهاد الشيخ العريفة عندما أفتى بهذا الجهاد يعني أفتى بهذا الجهاد يعني يعني هذا عالم دين إنسان يعني شيخ مرجع بالنسبة لنا يعني الفتاوي التي تعرض على الجهاد وكذا هي مستمدة من القرآن ونحن مرجعيتنا هي القرآن مش إنه نفسه جسده كل روحه في سبيل الله. I'm going to now ask the opinions of our guests in the studio, um, assuming that you you understood some of that, um, Imam Al Adawi. What is your response? Yeah, he is quoting the verse of Holy Quran that. Uh, says that when uh, religion comes under threat, uh, you have to sacrifice. Mm. But there is not a single uh, um, word about jihad and nikah. Mm. Uh, jihad bil anfus is there. Anfus means sacrifice. Of course, in the battlefields, what do we do? Yeah. We sacrifice our life. I don't think that he was any way convincing, apart from the, the part where he said he's quoting what a scholar, um, mm. Al Arifi, said. So mm. he is actually rely relying mm. on other fatwa. But what they call themselves Muslim scholars, they're using Quran to take women back in time to even before the time of Islam, in mm. the name of Islam. And they're relying on pe ignorance of some Muslims or some uh, people who do not actually read Quran and understand Islam as a religion. And uh, you know, I think this is just a propaganda to legalize what uh, what they, these people stand for. Sheikh Hamis, what, what do you, what's your response? The answer to the question is that when he says that there is no jihad in the Bible, in the Torah, the Prophet says, "Allah says, 'But the Messenger of Allah is the one who believes with his own hands and with his own hands.'" Yeah, anfus, anfus is not body. It's not body. Anfus is not sex. It's not. It's not body. It's not like uh, jahidu in with with using uh, your body in order to do the jihad. This is this is not from the Quran. This is what you think. This is your interpretation. نفس مية نفس جسد وجسم وبالنسبة بالتالي فهي يعني كل شيء في سبيل الله نجوى قدموه. ثم احنا اليوم لكل الهدف الاساسي من هذا كل هو الجهاد، هناك الرجال يذهبون للجهاد في الحرب واستعمال السلاح وكذا، بالنسبه للنساء تريد ان تشارك في الجهاد ما هي الوسيله التي تعتمدها؟ اف اف فور ذا سيك اوف ارجيومنت وي اكسبت ان تقدم خدمات على الساحه يعني في ساحه القتال تمكن ان تقدم خدمات ايضا لنصره اخوتها um, Imam Radawi would like to reply to you. Yeah, uh, if for the sake of argument we accept that, yes, uh, the verse of Holy Quran is saying to present your body 
uh, but it, it is not explaining that presenting body in the sexual manner. Mm. And uh, presenting the body there, it means to sacrifice your life. Is that the root of, of how this has happened? Is yeah, of how jihad on the car has been interpreted from misinterpreted. and Foscom taking your, yourself? People have interpreted that yes. in, in the sexual way. And I think uh, I mean, uh, <coughs> also the gender politics of how they use Quran now. They mm. said, go to Syria and fight and then you know support uh, the change. But when the change happened, like what's happened in, in Egypt or what happened in Tunisia or any Arab country or Libya, they will now start even religion to exclude women mm. so actually it's a playing card they use Islam as playing card mm. to uh, to include or exclude women to use women actually it's and and, yeah. and 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 this is they don't give value to women Allah and mm. Islam and the Prophet Muhammad and the Sahaba the, or Ahlul Bayt they, they always value women and we we saw a leading female uh, women in in Islamic uh, history but now what what is what's happening now is actually abuse of women in the name of Islam. And, and that leads to my next question for you, Sheikh Hamis. Um, there have been many reports about uh, rape and sexual abuse in Syria against Syrian women. Uh, will, this not, will this not put them under more risk and, and of sexual abuse? And, and uh, basically giving free range and, and allowing sexual abuse to take place? No, in Syria, the situation يثير الاعلام وهذه الاشاعات بالنسبه لهم هذا هذا النظام النظام السوري يقوم بعمليه الاغتصاب للمواطنات السوريات اما بالنسبه للنساء التي تذهب اللواتي يذهبن الى سوريا للجهاد لا يعتبر اغتصاب لان بمحض ارادتها ذهب يعني على المجاهدين يعني هذا هو and also there were atrocities there were atrocities done by the rebels themselves and mm. uh, even like we know there are uh, things uh, uh, that the Islamist groups in Syria also they committed atrocities mm. against uh, Shia or even yeah. Alawite women and even Christian uh, women and even women in Syria and what is happening in Raqqa northeast Syria where women are not allowed to sit on a chair but I want to go back to to his argument where he is actually what's happening in Syria it's uh, legalizing as you say yeah, the sexual right. abuse or rape in the name of Islam because yeah. we have seen uh, two cases of Syrian girls who are sick and they were obliged and forced by their family to practice this jihad and nikah. In the case of me, I'm working in the country of the people. There is a great job from the Syrian government that we don't have to do with the Syrian government. It started for years and years before the Syrian government. Yeah, but I mean, will, will you accept your wife or your daughter or your... Uh, that does bring me to my next question, actually, Sheikh Hamis. Would you um, encourage any woman in your family or close to you to undertake uh, jihad on the kah, given that you obviously support it? The question is very simple. The relationship is a personal relationship. What does it mean? أراد أن يذهب ليسافر ليمارس جهاد النكاح هي حرية شخصية. Would you would you allow your wife to do that? I mean, you seem to be slightly avoiding the question. Would, although you obviously think it's it's uh, it's a good thing, would you recommend it to a woman close to you, a member of your family, your wife, your sister? نعم. بالنسبة لي كما كما يعني سبق وأجبت هي المسألة مسألة شخصية يعني هي مرتبطة بها. ليست لي يعني إن هي رغيبت فهي فهي يعني لا لا أستطيع أن أمنعها لأنها في علاقتها يعني علاقة شخصية ما بينها وبين خالقها يعني علاقة عمودية. If if your wife wanted to do this, uh, she would be still your wife and do jihad in Nikah as well. Which what kind of Islam is this? كتبت لها يعني شهادة فذلك جيد إذا يعني بالطبع تبقى زوجك لأن أنا بالنسبة لنا إحنا that means you're totally going against Islamic Sharia and Quran and practice of Prophet Muhammad and any divine religion. But this is 
الشريعة والدين الإسلامي إذا كيف لديهم كيف يتحدثون عن شيء هم لا يمارسونه ولا يعرفونه Sheikh Hamis, are you, are you basing your uh, justification of Jihad al-Nikah on anything specific? Um, any particular verse in the Quran, any sunnah or hadith? Yeah. <laughs> يعني هناك عند في سورة الأنفال يعني كما تلاحظين هناك أو كما يلاحظ ضيفك الذي يجب أن يراجع عديد المعلومات لديه كما تلاحظون هناك جهاد الجهاد يمكن أن يكون بطرق مختلفة لدينا طرق محلل طرق حلال مو طرق حرام النصرة. النصرة يمكن أن تكون بطرق مختلفة وهم أولئك هم المؤمنون I, okay, just to interrupt you for a minute, um, there was an interesting uh, article in the Tunis Times uh, titled Jihad Nikah, 100 Pregnant Women with, Age, with, with, with AIDS, which brought up some of the legal and moral aspects of this. Um, what civil status would be given to women and their babies who return from performing Jihad al Nikah? What would be the consequences of this? Who, who, if it, who would be their father? Yeah, I the Arabs. Not for the Arabs. Not for the Arabs. Not for the Arabs. Not for well, um, thanks for joining us, Sheikh Hamis. And of course, everyone on the show is entitled to their own opinion. Thank you for giving yours. To get a more global perspective on what people thought of Jihad on the Kah, we asked people in Tunisia what they thought. خليها باش تخرج ممكن خاطر فما اغراءات اخرى كما الفلوس ولا حاجه من هكا بقينا اللي باش تمشي تخرج هي تعمل جهاد كما هكا نجم هي تجاهد لنا تمشي تلوج على خدمه تخدم باش نجم تصرف على دارهم تصرف على روحها من غير ما تمشي ما تقدرش تخرج تمشي لسوريا كما هكا ونزيدوا نشوفوا صورتنا كيكو سوا توانسه ولا ك معناها البلدان الاسلاميه بصفه عامه اي موش الدين بتاعنا موش لا دين لا اسلام لا حتى شيء عمره ما كان اسلام هذا هذا خاطينا شنو جهاد النكاح هاي يكتب على الزداق اليوم ومن غدوه يتلقى صفا كيكا هذا كيما صاير في اليمن ولا صاير في في مصر بتاع المتعه هذا زواج المتعه يكتب يكتب عليها ومن بعد يرجع ومن بعد يستلم أول حاجة نقولوا هكا في سبيل الله وعلى خاطر الريسك اللي باغ اكزومبل الرجال اللي يمشيوا يجاهدوا كل شيء يحبوا يعني يكونوا هما كأدي التسلية ولا كحاجة باش بوغ باسي لو طون أنا شفت بنات صحيح مشاو لسوريا مشاو رايحين رجال يعني هذه حقا شرعي حقا شرعي حقا شرعي وفي حد ذاتها بس اثنين مرضات الله هو عايز حاجة يعني بالنسبة للمسلم هو باش يموت شيء عاش بيه كان حق احنا هاو شنو مثلا هات الناس اللي الاغلبيه بتاعهم الاغلبيه بتاعهم يعني خوت كامل عيشه خايبه في في حد ذاته ما كثرها من في الشارع ومن بعد يعرف شيء مشكل هي مراه بتاعت انا مثلا ما نقبلش انه انسان مشى تاجر بجسد بالجسد بتاعه تحت اي مسمى من المسميات وبعد يقول لي اجى نولي ان نعيش انا وياك ونتشارك انا وياك تحت نفس السقف ونربيو صغار ونربيو اسره ونعملو هذا لا يستحق Joining us now on the phone, also from Tunisia, is Khaled Kanani, a professor of English at Sufs University. Thank you very much for being with us today, Professor Kanani. Pleased to be with you on this uh, studio and uh, about this debate. Thank you. My first question for you is, um, I think many people view Tunisia, Tunisia as relatively moderate um, in the Muslim world. Why are women coming from Tunisia to Syria to take part in Jihad on the Kah? So first of all, this, uh, the news that came from Syria about Tunisian girls carrying out sexual jihad has created a real outcry in Tunisia. Yeah. Because 
uh, we are all aware this has nothing to do with uh, Islam, and there is not a single Quranic verse or hadith justifying such practices. It's, uh, again, an example of how religion is politically uh, used, instrumentalized. As you know, the conflict in Syria is highly political, and without falling into the trap of conspiracy theories, we can safely say that such groups, jihadist groups, have been uh, assisted financially and logistically by intelligent agencies. Otherwise, how could uh, these Tunisian young girls travel thousands of kilometers and arrive safely to their destination if it were not for a well-organized network mm. using charity organizations that have proliferated after the uh, January 12-11 uh, uprising. So you're asking me how, 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 how does Tunisia come to be, uh, Tunisia who is considered as a moderate country for 50 years, come to be engaged in such uh, a conflict? The direct cause is the uh, dismantling of the uh, political police in Tunisia after the January uh, 2011 rising. This dismantling uh, has enabled jihadist groups to uh, recruit, mm. to raise funds, and to organize. And the, the recruits have been Tunisian young women and even young men who are sent to battle there. Okay? The real cause is the lack of any political and cultural awareness. Uh, the levels of education in Tunisia for the last 20 years have been dwindling. And there has been such political awareness among uh, the young. There is also the decline of the traditional role of religious institutions. Uh, the fear of radical, politicized Islam has led dictators to put religious institutions under tight control, and so they have lost their traditional role of advice or providing answers to religious questions. This role has been taken by other radical groups who can, as you know, issue any decree, any religious law, legalize or forbid any action. I'm just going to um, interject there and, and with a quote from the Telegraph newspaper here in the UK, which featured an article saying Lotfi Ben Jadu, the Tunisian minister, had confirmed this was happening. And he said they have sexual relations with 20, 30, 100 militants. Afterwards, they come home pregnant. Is uh, this an exaggeration of the situation? I don't think, I don't think what the Home Secretary, Lotfi Bin Jadu, has said is an exaggeration. It's a reality. We don't know the exact number, but we know that many Tunisian girls uh, have been practicing sexual jihad in Syria. And many of them have come back pregnant, by mm. the way. And it poses, as you know, social problems. Uh, many of them have been taken care of by the Ministry of Women here and by other uh, women uh, organizations. So I think it's a true story, it's a real story. I'm just going to let my studio guest, Hala Diab, respond to you. I do agree with, with your guest, what he said that uh, this phenomena has been used in the name of Islam for political agenda. Because mm. if we look actually at the political perspective of uh, this uh, jihad tourism or the jihad nikah uh, phenomena, it's actually to achieve establishing an Islamic state inside Syria gradually through nourishing uh, uh, the, the uh, ground or like the infrastructure uh, by more jihadists who are going there to fight, but also these jihadists are going to mar get married or uh, have sex with other women, and then they will have uh, children, and then gradually these children will, will be brought up on the same uh, Salafi mm. jihadist concept. It's about the political agenda of building Islamic State, uh, so mm. Syria gradually will be a hub for yeah. exporting, um, uh, you know, to terrorism and exporting uh, Salafism to, to the Levant. And um, thank you. My next question uh, to you, Professor Kanani, is um, Tunisia and Syria are relatively moderate countries. Why, why has um, Tunisia emerged at the centre of this issue? And, and I'm also interested in what you said about networks and charities being involved in some way. Could you elaborate on that? I think the, main, the two main causes are poverty and ignorance. The government uh, has not, I mean, the, the secular government of Ben Ali has not offered an alternative to the discourse of radical Islam. So we, we have pursued in Tunisia a secular, uh, we have pursued secular policies without a cultural or political background or support. 
So the result is a kind of schizophrenia that is modernity without the real aspects of a modern society, uh, like uh, uh, women's uh, real equality, not just legal equality, uh, good education, Russian education, uh, social equality. So all these have been lacking, and the young have been quickly lured or attracted by the uh, simple message of radical Islam, okay? You know, the message of radical Islam is that, mm. first of all, it simplifies things, and second, it empowers those who believe in its teachings, okay? It gives them a kind of moral superiority. What would your reaction be to that? No, 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 no. I would say that this is a warning not only for Syrians, but for, for the whole world, that if this kind of mentality is uh, promoted, as the, the brother was saying, I agree, they, they recruit their people from ignorant and mm. uh, uneducated people. Most of the suicide bombers are coming, uh, being recruited from the villages and the remote places of uh, various Muslim countries. Mm. Uh, then they become suicide bombers or they become jihad, uh, they join the jihad and nikah. Uh, they are not educated and ladies or they are not educated people. And not enough is being done, mm, it's, yeah. it seems, in the, in the community to counter the belief that this is If they permissible. believed in true Islam, they would not agree to do this. I want to add to that that within Muslim household, a uh, women's role have been also much restricted by mm. shame or by uh, haram. Mm. And uh, there, there are actually rules for women and rules for men. Like mm. there is double standards in, in the use of if Islam, not in Islam itself, yeah. in the use of Islam, in, in, in empowering women or, or excluding women. And I I think with legalizing jihad and nikah, it gives a um, horizon or a space for some women to be liberated in order to play, to think they are playing a heroic act uh, by being part of uh, uh, jihad and then go to paradise. For you, uh, Professor Kanani, we, we got some opinions from Tunisians who believe this, this adds to a highly negative portrayal of Muslims. So obviously, many people, most people, the vast majority in Tunisia don't agree with jihad on the cast. So my question to you is what's being done within the, the Islamic community in Tunisia to, to counter the belief that this is permissible? I would like first to say that this has increased Islamophobia, not even among non-Muslim people. Mm. Okay, so there is much Islamophobia even among Muslims today. What should be done is, first of all, education. We should provide the young with a rational education. Uh, second, I, I should like to, to suggest that there should be a, a new definition of who is the sheikh, the alim. Uh, anyone today can promulgate fatwas, especially on the proliferating uh, TV uh, satel uh, channels. How, so, can, how can we ensure who, I mean, Sh uh, Sheikh Al-Arifi was um, at the center of this controversy because he, re he was the one who said it was permissible. How, how can the Islamic community stop these kind of rogue sheikhs from spreading these ideas? I think they should purify Islam of its political base purposes. They should make it a spiritual religion as it has always been, mm. and uh, they should get away from uh, the mixture, the, the dirty mixture of politics and religion. Uh, third thing, I, th I think Muslims should be aware of the modern context in which we live. We should give up the idea that by returning to a starting point in the past, we can progress. I think we can only regress. Third, mm. we should never forget that women should be our equals. We can never build a modern, rational, uh, developed society without uh, ensuring women's rights. Thank you very much for joining the conversation. It has been a pleasure. It Thank has you. Been my pleasure. We need to increase awareness, and uh, recently I also heard that some of these jihadis uh, were being treated in Israel. So this shows that uh, there is uh, mm. there are people behind uh, treated uh, yeah, medically. The medical. When okay. they get uh, injured, they are taken yeah. to Israel and they are tre being treated there. It's it's not in the interest of Muslims, mm. any Muslim, to have this kind of fights there. And God helps Syrians if these kind of people take over the regime and start ruling the country. God help the women there in mm. future. So Syrians should wake up and uh, not uh, get rid of these outside fighters from Syria and uh, decide, make their own decision about their future. I think this is the responsibility of Muslims also to raise awareness among uh, communities mm. and among families and um, among vulnerable people in order to do you agree with um, do you agree with Professor Kanani that um, you, we need Muslims need to focus on a modern 
Islam and, and leave behind I these think that there, there, there is a need of re-contextualizing uh, Islam within the challenges that Muslims have today because Muslims today they have more challenges than they have it 2,000 or thousand years ago mm. during uh, the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad and we need Islamic discourse need to be in a way modernized but yet uh, we still have to keep the, the core uh, principles of Islam but we need to, ch to, um, to address the challenges that our uh, Muslims are facing and also I think we need to empower women she should have the, the urge and the confidence and the power mm. to contribute positively to the society and sure. to be a life maker not actually okay um, um, unfortunately we have to end there so a big thank you to uh, my guests um, Imam Mohammed Aradawi and uh, Dr. Hala Diab and please tune in next time to Forbidden Talk where we discuss more controversial issues